Um, so tonight we're going to be looking at a, a few different things. We've got um, uh, a project that we're going to be looking at, um, a bit of mastering using Isotope Ozone. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at um, a little bugbear of mine uh, on the forums um, and showing you how to embed YouTube videos and how to embed SoundCloud just so you can sort of share links with us and tell us what you want a bit easier and make it a bit easier for us to sort of figure it out. Um, and then we've got a couple of tech tips from Paul Maddox as well, which we'll be letting here. They're, they're going to be out on this site on Friday, but we'll give you a, a quick preview of them um, this evening. And we're joined as well here with Brian Spence. Howdy doody. <laughs> and Chris Agnelli. I'm in the background, but I'm going to bring myself up now. And Hello. <laughs> So as you can see, we've got a, a few few cameras tonight. We've got Chris in the in the background. Uh, we've got our sort of multi-screen setup. This is what we're going to be using for the. Uh, Will I show the viewers what we have here? Just this is. This is where it all goes wrong. This is where it all goes yeah. wrong. We have <laughs> mixing desks. We have our output. We have our mixer where we're cutting. We have live Twitter feeds. We have Bry in the background on his laptop. Phil in the background and cameras over there so it's a small compact space so yeah well i'll, I'll give you a bit of bit of background and and what uh we've got running here we've got uh it's a wee hardware box called the black magic atem tv studio it's like a hdmi switcher so we can switch from uh, a couple of different laptops and a couple of different hdmi cameras so when we're doing our sort of live broadcast which we hope to be doing a, a bit more of um uh, and specific, specifically events like the Stiff Kitten where we're going to be out on the road. Um, this will sort of help us sort of switch between cameras and hopefully we'll have some really interesting master classes coming up. As I said earlier, we've got Ian Donovan is going to be in the Stiff Kitten doing a, a sort of R master class and then an R Q and A. Um, he signed a Bedrock Records and has been releasing sort of a lot of really nice progressive house and techno. And then on the night he'll be DJing as well. Um, we'll hopefully be recording... Um, well, we'll definitely be recording the whole thing live and hopefully, depending on uh, what the internet's like down there, we'll, we'll try and broadcast it live on the night as well. <coughs> so, um, yeah, the first thing I, I was going to um, just run through, and it's just something that a few people keep asking about on the forums, is how to embed different stuff. So it's not strictly a music production uh, question, but um, some pretty useful anyway if you're wanting to sort of get more active in the in the website. So I'm going to just create a, a quick topic here. What, so for what, what is the major problems um, with well, embedding? Uh, just if, if people are wanting to share YouTube links or SoundCloud mm -hmm. links, instead of just sort of sharing the link so someone has to go and click, click, and on, it. click on it and move away from the page, it'll just sort of embed into the, into the page. And it just makes it really handy for us, especially if we're going through and looking for get that sounds or tutorial ideas, instead of us having to sort of copy and paste the links or... Um, sort of click away from the page just means we can play straight on the page and it's a wee bit easier to go through things okay. and, and for other members as well so um, I'll go into YouTube and I'll find uh, a good Sonic Academy video to embed go for Deep House Um, YouTube changed their embed a while ago, so it's maybe why a few people have been having some problems with um, embedding f YouTube files on it. Um, so you click here to share, and then you click the embed button, and you have to make sure you're selecting use old embed code. The new embed code just doesn't work on our site for whatever reason. Um, and once you've selected that, you can just copy all this stuff here and uh, we can add a new topic we'll call this a test topic and then just paste it in and before you post you can hit preview and it'll show you whether it's worked or not and then you can go ahead and post it and there's a similar sort of thing for SoundCloud if you want to share your SoundCloud link click on the share button and then go down here to uh, your embed code and copy that. And I'll just reply to my own post. That's a very nice photograph of you, Phil. Yeah, that was uh, back in the day. Back in rock, <laughs> rock in the old school look. Yeah. <laughs> so we can preview that again, and you can see that the uh, 
SoundCloud link is, is coming up there. So just in case you ever wondered how it was done. Well, <clears throat> that sorts out forum posts. Yep. Uh, you've been working on a track this week. Yeah, um, I've been working on a track with a friend of mine that... Uh, Sorry, can I stop you there? Yeah. You don't have any friends? <laughs> oh. We, we know Wait, that. What are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Not my friends? Uh. Uh, so, yeah, I've been working uh, uh, on this track with a, a good buddy of mine, Martin. So maybe listening. Hi, Martin. Uh, he is a uh, son of Methuselah. He's um, had some stuff. Um, Sorry, so uh, No, we're, we've been... He's been coming over, so... The son of and, Methuselah? And bits of, son of Methuselah. Who's Methuselah? Um, is that the bird with the snakes in her hair? No, no idea. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So we've been doing doing a track, um, sort of quite commercial, um, housey sort of thing, and uh, yeah, it was again. It's a sort of question people have been asking about, sort of mixed downs and sort of mastering. So uh, we used ozone on this, and I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of the difference it makes. Um, a lot of people ask, how do you, you know, there's been a bit of discussion on the forums about this sort of, what's the magic tricks, you know, to get your your stuff super, super big or whatever. And I, I mean, I've always sort of said it's a combination of, you know, the actual mix down, um, the original sounds you're using and, you know, everything everything <coughs> builds up 5% at a time. Yeah. You I think a lot of people are under the impression that it's, you get to the end and regardless of what it sounds like, you just stick on this magic mastering sweet that, that uh, you mix your track this really <coughs> quality thing but it's not the case yeah and w- one of the things that I, I find especially with this track is um i mean mastering does help i'll sort of i'll, I'll give you an example of the track here <coughs> without the mastering Sorry, on. Can I, can I, what, what's your key points to mastering what 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 are you trying to achieve with mastering that you haven't done a mix down <laughs> i mean it's for me i'm looking for a sound and it doesn't matter what way I get there as long as it ends up sounding the way I envisage in my head. So sometimes a very minimal mastering will will achieve that. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a if it's a, it tends to be the more sort of like commercially fizzy your sort of sound wants the more mastering you would do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think when you just when you're touching on that point where it doesn't matter how you get there, that was one of the things I'm very aware of. Like I don't really care what I do with the tools that I've got. In yeah. terms of you know ratios and and things like that, there I don't care what I put on it. Yeah. As long as it comes out with a sound I like. Whenever I was back in my uni days, like I was doing exams and stuff, and yeah. a lot of the time <clears throat> you were given a track and you had to you had to do uh, you had to mix it or master it, whatever. And you and I went in and and just you know completely mashed something up to get it to a specific sound that I was looking for. Yeah. And whenever. I went in for you know the review whatever they got there they they came in and they were, they pointed it out and went well, you know what have you done here why have you done this you know f and you're like well you know <laughs> you you were none the wiser you know when you were listening to it but because they seen what it done you know yeah I don't think it's it's all about how it sounds <laughs> at the end of the day yeah I mean I think that's a, a you know that is the key thing you know it's to try and get out of that concept of that there's a, there's a certain way to do things on each track every track's completely different. And, you know, it. you have to just go with what, you know, I, I haven't, well, I might not have an idea in my head. I might have a track that I want to sound like, mm. you know what I mean? So this, this track, we had a couple of different um, tracks in, in this genre that we were A, B in and just sort of going like the drums are, you know, drums sound more squished or they sound mm-hmm. more pressurized or something. And it was just a, you know, a sort of and a you, journey. Would you, would you tend to go, I suppose in my head, what I'm trying to say is, it, is that a, a mix down thing or a mastering thing? It's both, both, and and not and and for this track as well. Um, at at the same time, I'll I'll play you the track and you can sort of have a listen, and I'll I'll show you with the, out the mastering and with the mastering. So there you can hear it without out the mastering on. And it always bugged me that the drums just sort of had a had like this separation between them. Um, it just sort of sounds like individual sounds. And then when you turn the mastering on, it's, it's like a gel, isn't it? It just yeah, it sort of glues everything together. Mm. And we'll play it with the whole section with the mastering on.
and I'll go into the ozone here and sort of show you the different elements and what they're doing to the mix. Just so you know, guys, we're, we've got our uh, Twitter and Facebook and all set up here. So if you just want to be asking any questions, just um, use the hashtag Sonic Academy Live and that'll come through. Um, so on Ozone, I, I think I started off with a, one of the presets. Um, and again, I'm not put off uh, when I'm looking through presets by, you know, there's one for rock, there's one for dance, you know, blah, 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 the CD master. I'll go through them all and pick the one that I, I think sounds best. So, you know, I, I always I always wonder what rock tracks they're listening to or ballad tracks because they they burn no relation to some <laughs> presets. But they can be quite good on a like a ballad on a dance track. Can just Yeah. I mean, something. again, I think it's back to this whole concept of, you know, do whatever ever you think is just, you know, pushing it towards that sound that you want or the feeling you want or. Um, so I will, I'll turn all the stuff off here and you can sort of hear how each of the different elements of, of the mastering process are impacting it. You can instantly hear when I, when I turn it off there, like the, the transients on the, on the drums are coming through. Um, um, what actually happened there was when I, uh, when I was processing... I thought that the mastering was losing some of the transients, so I actually added um, the Oxford Transmod or the Sonox Transmod, and basically it adds a bit of transients back in. It's very, very, very small amount. Um, so I'll go through the, the effects one by one. You can hear what they're doing. You can hear that initial dynamics one, which is basically like a bus compressor. Um, it's sort of just taking a tiny bit of that sort of transient attack off the drums and sort of bringing them in together a wee bit more. And it sort of just pressurizes the whole mix. You can, you can sort of feel the weight of the mix um, just sort of coming into play. And it sort of brings the, the bass tighter and uh, just sort of gels it all together which is what you're sort of after from a, a mix compressor what uh, way do you normally start when you're you're doing the, the dynamics there do you i mean do you solo through your bands when you're doing it or again you know i'm not really thinking about it too much i'm picking the preset that i want and then you know just going in and either e easing off or or you know adding it up or you know it's not I'm not really going too technically into the, the different bands. I mean, if, if there was something specifically that I was having a problem with, you know, or I was hearing them in, in the track that I would, I would maybe go in and try easing back on things or turning up stuff. But generally speaking, I'm just sort of picking the, the preset that's pretty close and sort of just dialing stuff back and forward. Do you have a kind of a rule of thumb? Like whenever you, you put your, your preset on, do you automatically look to the threshold and go, that's uh coming in too much on it and I need to ease back to a certain no DB I'm not I'm I'm not looking at anything I'm listening always just listening with you know to what it sounds like and you know if if, if I hear something that if I think oh that just sounds too squished then I'll go in and, and look maybe where that's happening you know so you're you, I think and this is maybe a problem that, that a lot of people can get into is they're using their eyes you know to to check whether the ratio or the or the threshold or whatever has been pulled back too much before they're listening with their ears. And, and then, you know, the decision should come from your ears back the way. You know, you should be listening to something, f finding out what the issue is, and then going in and, and trying to alter it as opposed to looking at something, thinking to yourself, oh, that doesn't look right. I'll change that. You know, it, mm. I, I, I do agree. I think that too many people rely on graphics and, and get too bogged down, and that's not right. That's not right. I'm always a big believer in if it sounds right, do it. And it's that I don't have a set. I suppose I do have a set mastering chain. You know, my big thing with mastering is always very small amounts of things. You know, it's yeah one dB of EQ or one and a half dB. Yeah, That's I mean, it. I think you have to, yeah. uh, th you know, go over, experiment over the, over your normal boundaries, and then you can pull it back. You know what I mean? And I think that'll teach you, you know, what is too much compression if you go way too much. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you'll be able to hear that and then you'll be able to dial it back and then you're you're starting to build a picture in your mind of how the different sort of parameters are affecting things. And if you say you switched it on and it sounded uh, like it was too too squishy like and you'd lost all your transients, would you 
Would you go back on the threshold, or would you you dial down the ratio, or what, um, what would you look to? Well, on in this particular instance, because it was only the drums that I, I found that the tran- transients were being squished on that I didn't like. Mm-hmm. I liked the way everything else was being, you know, squished. I went into the actual drum track and actually modified it right. as, as opposed to modifying the the master because I actually really liked how it was sounding on everything else. Mm-hmm. If I, if I thought it was having that negative effect on the whole track, then I would have, you know... And I think that's an interesting thing, that, you know, the mixing and mastering portion can sometimes be intrinsically linked. It depends whether you want to go through the whole mastering process yourself or, you are you know, you want to leave it to someone else. Yeah, or sometimes I... When i have uh, making a track or whatever, I'd, I'd start out and I'd maybe do a bit of the drums... <laughs> And then I would go, I want these drums sounding a lot tighter. And I would start squashing them up. And then if I had a bit of a bass line in, I would end up almost doing the mastering at the very start of the song. And to then, your individual groups or tracks? yeah. No, to the individual tracks, but I, w- I would have it on the master channel. Yeah. And then I kind of end up, without without doing it on purpose, I would end up trying to push everything in around it. And I found it made it a lot tighter rather yeah. I've done it. I've done it. You know, I do it both ways. Where I would make a whole track, and then I would go and put all my compression on after. But I find you get interesting results doing, yeah. You know, squashing everything at the start and then pushing stuff into it. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's 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 experiment and it's trying different things. This track, I did something similar as what Brian's saying. You know, halfway through the track, I, I decided I want to ma- hear what it sounds like mastered, and then that's when I sort of started fine tuning the different elements. So I'll I'll play the the next part of this or well i'll show you the next pl- part of the plugin which is the sort of maximizer that's these are the two sort of dynamics ones and these affect the sort of obviously the dynamics of the track and how loud it can be and you can hear there that it's really dr- dramatic or dramatically affecting the the transients there and you can see in the uh in the viewer up here that it's sort of cutting those clicks off. And those dropouts are from the actual clicks. So, so, sorry, can I stop? That graphical representation, that the sort of darker line, is that the what the compressor's doing, that visual representation? Uh, the green line is... Yeah, uh, over the waveform, the green line over Yeah, the, it's yeah. how much it's being compressed. Yeah, that's, how much? That's kind of an interesting view I've never seen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of compression going on there, but again, you know, it's it's. I wanted that super. If you listen to it, like like some Marion or any of the sort of new, really sort of electronicy, sort of Frenchy house stuff, their stuff is really squished and it's all sort of really upfront. Um, so the maximizer. Again, I think I dialed it back and forward a bit and sort of um, tweaked various parts to sort of... I mean, it's really only this um, knob gives you your threshold and then you've got your um, different types of um, limiting. <coughs> so you can go from like super crunchy to sort of smooth and, and back. And again, it's using your ears and sort of trying to figure out what sounds most, most pleasant. And you might go back and forth a few times. Is uh, ozone something <coughs> that you normally use like when you're... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've started using it a lot more now. I mean, it definitely gives a nice sound. I, I thought previous versions were a wee bit too harsh, maybe, on on, on some instances. I think this has a more transparent feel on, on some of the presets. I, I think I had Ozone when it was back in Ozone 2 or 3, yeah. I think it was, and I didn't I didn't warm to it at all. But, but what's your, what is your go-to compressor, Bri? Um, I had the Synoxys stuff for a while, but... I tend to, to try and not have anything. Go to? Yeah, yeah. I tend to, just when I when I get to that stage, I, I just I would maybe buy something new just to play with it, you know, and try and get a different yeah. sound out of it. I've tried a, tried a few things recently. I tried... Um, um, <coughs> you get to the mastering stage and you buy a new plugin just to... <laughs> 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 or, yeah, or it's bound to work this time. Yeah, I got the, <laughs> the demo of um, the SSL DNA plugins. I thought their master bus compression was nice. Um, but uh, Isotope sort of gave me this plugin to try out. So <laughs> <laughs> I gave it a go, and, and yeah. I genuinely liked it. You're not um, getting paid to say this, are we? No, no, no. <laughs> so the next part of the plugin is uh, so you've got your sort of dynamics, and once you're sort of happy with them, you can you can start investigating some of the other areas. <clears throat> you've got a harmonic exciter, um, which sounds pretty cool, but you need to 
just be wary that you're not sort of doing too much. It just sort of adds a bit of air and a, a bit of sort of breadth, that sort of top end of the of the spectrum. Um, and again, you can overdo it. You're probably not going to be able to hear it through the sort of 128k bit rate on the on the uh, video there, but trust me, there's something happening. Um, and then you're well, I'll go into actually show you the, the things you've got. Just basically, it's split up into your different bands, and you can sort of adjust your your bands here, and then you can have a an amount for each band, and they'll work independently or you can sort of adjust them as a whole. So again, if you want sort of your bass to be sort of more crunchy or have a bit more excitement on them. Which I wouldn't recommend, so it sort of muddies up things quite a lot. Um, but yeah, you can go in and you can, you can tweak stuff to your heart's content. Um, but it tends to work sort of a bit better on the top end and stuff just to give that extra wee bit of sparkle and then you've got your stereo imaging and again subtlety works best here a lot of the time again when i'm sort of mixing the track down or, or where i'm working on the sounds i'm conscious of that width anyway and sort of where i'm positioning sounds in the stereo field so i'll sort of I'll always have my pads out wide. I'll have my sort of bass pretty much centered, vocals pretty much centered, drums pretty much centered, except for like bongos and sort of ancillary percussion and stuff like that, which will sort of bring wider. All the effects super wide, and then the sort of riffs um, wide as well. So I, I'm still a bit s scared of, of width, which is, sounds strange. I'm scared of everything. I think there's. I'm a, scared of bass. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes we, back to the vinyl vinyl guys. stuff. Yeah, yeah I mean, when we used, we used to. Guys, before CDs and MP3s and whatever, you had to cut on the record, and the, the wider the grooves, which was the stereo image, the lower the volume, and you always wanted the loudest certain record. Plus, really, really wide uh, stuff could blow the head, so they would tend to narrow it down in the mastering suite. And I just I was in so many mastering suites where the engineers were saying just watch the width and that sort of phase inversion thing as well you know i just yeah I'm i mean it was i think it was much more of a deal in the low end we i think we sent them a track once with like a juno with had had juno chorus on the bass and they was, it just said that's nah, not going to work like yeah um but yeah i mean uh, nowadays obviously you're not you know everything's sort of pretty much digital but i suppose it's still to bear in mind i mean if you look at the 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 imaging here on this you know we actually have the um band 1 and 2 sort of turned down more than band three and four so you do have your bass sort of so pushed, a, neg back. a negative value with mono yeah it sort of makes it more mono and then positive value so obviously make it a bit more stereo and again just more stereo as you're going up you know you, you again it's about that you know it's just about adding that tiny mm -hmm. wee extra one percent of sparkle to the top end or a wee bit of space or something that you know um just makes a bit of a bit of difference you'll notice of no eq on there Again, I like to, you know, try and do things at the mix stage. Um, try and EQ my sounds and sort of mix them and, and have all the balancing done there and really just use the mastering for the sort of loudness and then that extra sort of sweetness stuff. Do you have all your EQs on your uh, group tracks then? Yeah, I've got a lot of or individual. A lot of stuff happening on the, on the groups. Um, and then even on individual... Signs of probably have various different things. Yeah, the kick's just got a compressor on there. I've been using the um, one nine seven six compressor a lot on drums recently. Or nineteen seventy six, as we like to say. The nineteen seventy six. <laughs> yeah, was well, it modelled on a, uh, a drummer? Is it? Yeah, crazy drummer. Yeah, um, and it seems to work. There's a really um, you can get really nice attack and sort of it sort of has a, that real pressurized squishy sort of sound. Um, and on the bass, yeah, there are sort of multiple bass. That's a good one. Yeah, so I've got like a mid bass, and that sort of has a bit of mid range. And again, it's really sort of squished. The bass 
the bass I want to be solid through each of the chord changes. So it's about really squishing that down and sort of limiting the the frequency range. So you've sort of just got it all sort of powerful at each of the notes that you're playing. It can be quite hard to get sometimes. So I think you you know sometimes you really have to compress compress it to the max. Like there's a a question here on the the comments. Um, is there a similar tool in Ableton that's useful compared to uh, Ozone? Ozone? Yeah, well, let's see <coughs> if we can. I'll, I'll try and do a sort of similar master with some of the stuff on. You generally can get a, a very similar sound out of all of the built-in things. It's it's just that yeah, the there is a chain. slight... I, I find with the, um, the Ableton stuff that you lose some of the, the attack... Yeah, it's just a wee bit. Their softer, limiter, like. their limiter is probably the weakest link I find in that in their master and stuff. You've got the mix gel plugin, which actually works really well. Is and that the, one you've made? I don't recognize it. Mix gel. Yeah. Um, I think that is a. Is that a plugin. preset? Yeah, I think it is a preset. Yeah. Um, and then it's just a a low attack. Then is it? Yeah, and then you you could maybe use something. Uh even before it to just take off some of the or just to sort of pressurize it up a bit with a sort of really fast attack pretty fast release and you sort of get that pumping thing where you're sort of cutting the transients off but you're sort of bringing up the the other parts of the sound and I'm not not adding a lot there I'm just sort of really just a nudge of that to sort of cut off that real clicky part of the transient Um, and then I would go for so we actually did a did a tech tip ages ago on um, exciters on how to do it in Ableton yeah if you look back in the tech tips I can't remember how I did it it was a saturator on the high end just and um, then we can go for a bit of multiband generally speaking when I'm using multiband uh, I want to compress the mids a bit less than I'm compressing the top and bottom. Um, the mids are where a lot of the sort of detail and, um, you know, the hits or the um, attacks of sounds are. So if you sort of ease back on them, you tend to still get the detail where uh, and with the bass and the, the tops, you can sort of create a bit of, of more of that pressure sound without sort of totally destroying all the dynamics in your in your track. And you can solo the solo the bands. I only really want to have that sort of effect in the really high stuff. The other thing you can do with the multi-band compressor is uh, use the amount, so you can sort of basically do parallel compression directly in the in the plugin. And then just for good measure, fire a limiter on the end. As I said, I think that's probably the weakest link in the chain is, is Ableton's limiter. It just doesn't quite do it for me. Um, but it's not, not too bad. It'll sort of bring the level up a bit. So we'll uh, grip all these and see what the... Can is it possible to AB these? Yes, that's what I'm going to give okay. a try to now. So <coughs> I wish that uh, you could fly. No, well, <laughs> I would I would wish that uh, Ableton would build in an AB thing. Something uh, I like to do is always stick a, a track at the top and notice you've got one there. Yeah. That I would AB back and forth, but you've got all your stuff on your, on your mastering chain. <coughs> on the master track and whenever you're ABing back and forth you you want to lose oh, wow, want to yeah. lose the mastering chain when you're doing it and I find I've had to make like a subgroup and it's yeah or if you could bypass the mastering mm. or something yeah let's see what we're that's not gonna work obviously got something else assigned to <laughs> number one on my keyboard <laughs> I guess cutting out the drums there so the AB didn't really work What else have we got? Got something random. Okay. 
try a different key. See, I don't, Golden. I don't think I've got. I don't, <laughs> sorted out. <laughs> I don't think I've got eight. I'll have to just get rid of all these, do you? Anyway, coming up later on, we have a uh, pulmonic. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yes, yeah, so you're yeah, maybe getting a bit you more. Like, you actually, uh, you've made it better now. You must have messed about it. Really well. <laughs> Yeah, so you can probably you probably if you worked a bit more got a bit closer, but again I just think when you start pushing the volume up on the limiter enabled, then you just can't get that same level without the mm. without destroying the the sound of it. Uh, so any I other? think that's mastering. Uh, Psychotron has uh, <laughs> emailed in saying why why am I skirt of width? I think that's pretty self explanatory. <laughs> uh, and we we're going to play in uh, like Saturday Kitchen here in the UK. We play in. Uh, some uh, old videos, and we're going to play on Paul Maddox Tech Tips. Is that this right? isn't an old video. This is a brand new, oh, it's a brand new, brand new, brand new we're, we're exclusive. It's it's Ex so new that we haven't even edited it, so you're going to have to excuse the. What are you? Are you playing it from Screenflow? Okay. Yeah, you sent me Screenflow, so we're <laughs> you can render it out there now. I'll play it out of Screenflow, sure. There's a little odds. Can you full screen it? No, no, for it not. Okay. Okay, well, enjoy this, guys, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hi, and welcome to the Sonic Academy Tech Tip. Um, today, I'm going to be showing you my favorite technique for layering and cleaning kick drums. So first off, I'll show you what we've got. Uh, these are just two kicks which have been uh, lifted from records. Uh, we've got a low one here with a bit of noise on it. As you can hear, that's got quite a bit of, uh, there's a bit of a bongo and some other percussion and things on there. And a higher one, which is a bit more mid-rangey and has also got a bit of reverb to it. So first up, um, I'll show you how to do the, the cleaning aspect. Uh, first of all, set a loop around your kick. Um, it kind of helps to uh, actually have the loop uh, starting before the start of the sample, just because live can sometimes glitch um, it, with the aut automation if you don't do this. Um, so we'll set that up so that's looping. So a low one, we'll deal with that first. Okay, and then uh, add an auto filter <clears throat> on a low pass and just start automating the uh, the cutoff. I used to do this using simpler and just using the filter envelopes, but by having a, um, an actual automation curve, you can get much more sort of precise control over it. And obviously you can see it relative to the waveform as well, which I find is quite useful. So usually something like that. You can hear that's better, but we've still got a bit too much of that, um, the sort of bongo sound coming through it then. So let's pull it lower there. And there's just a little bit of the other perk sound coming there. So lower there as well. Nearly there. There we go. So you can see just by sort of tweaking these few points on the uh, on the filter curve, you can get the uh, you really control the uh, the filter so that you get the initial transient coming through, but you can really really clamp down on all the extra sound. So that's pretty nice. I mean, that potentially you could use that on its own. But so let's uh, freeze that track and flatten it. Um, that's just because sometimes when you put in filters on it can actually alter the phase of the waveform So when we're doing the uh, the uh, visual lining up bit that we're coming on to now um, the, It makes to make sure what you're seeing is accurate so There's our low kick frozen and so now let's try layering some of the other one into it So the trick to this is that you want the sort of phase of the two kicks to line up perfectly so this is why doing it in uh, in a range view is useful because you can see the actual uh, the waveforms and how they line up with one another. So uh, you basically want the sort of peaks of one, uh, the sort of the curves of the waveform on one to be matching up with those on the other. So <clears throat> as you can see on this one, they're not quite there yet. So if we just turn the grid off, hit Command and Four, and just try sliding it backwards and forwards and see if there's a point where they all line up, which there isn't quite on this one, but it's uh, it's not far off. So we could maybe go into that and change the tuning. Oops, so you can see, and just fiddle with the tuning until there's a maybe line up a little bit more sweetly. Uh, not quite, maybe we need to tune up a little bit. Now, there we go, you can see that's kind of almost blue. Let's just fine tune down a little bit. <clears throat> you can see that sort of the main sort of uh, punch of the kick around here, the waves are more or less in phase. 
So then we don't want the, punch, the attack of both phases, so show fades and fade this one in. So we're kind of using just the punch of the uh, the high kick um, coupled with the, uh, the, the base end of the low kick. So... Straggler there. Get rid of those. Turn the master down a little bit. And you can hear that they send like a real nice uh, solid combination together. So, what I usually do for my next step then is to uh, turn the grid back on. As you can see, we've just moved slightly off the grid, so just move them back. But together, of course, you maintain the relationship. So if we just select this one and make sure we select a little bit of silence there as well, um, just to make sure we've got it, and then do consolidate, which is Command and J. And uh, do the same on this one, Command and J. Now these two uh, bits of audio here, <clears throat> if we create a new MIDI track and drag them in one by one, oops, drag them in one by one, uh, <clears throat> group that and then drag the other one in on a chain um, the good thing with this is we can now get a duo with our audio tracks and we now have a MIDI track with the nice layered kick on it but um, with the added bonus of having separate level controls for the low and high portion so it's good for rather than having to EQ your kick too heavily you can just sort of adjust the balance between high and low to get it sitting right in your mix so yeah, that's my uh, favorite technique for layering and cleaning kick drums. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is, uh, we've had a question about sort of Anna and big riffs. Um, and I did a thing a while ago. I'll try and find it. Uh, it was a Hardwell recreation. Um, Hardwell riff. Um, I'm basically a. Um, it was sort of how to make super super big uh, riff signs. Um, what was the what was the track uh, that the guy was asking for? W and W main stage yeah so I'll, I'll try and do something along the same lines um that track was using sort of squares and pulses so let me just have a listen to this Let's see if this is bring it up on <laughs> yeah so i think one of the the keys to a lot of the riffs you're hearing now today is all the all the sort of different layers um you know it's not just sort of one one sound um, and one sort of melody. There's a whole bunch of different stuff going on. So we'll go through the, this Hardwell one that I did and I'll sort of explain in a bit more detail how everything's sort of put together and, and what you need to do. Um, and like a lot of the stuff that I've been hearing seems to follow this sort of technique. And it's basically... Um, all the different stuff sort of separated out in the different uh, tracks. And then I sort of pad, gelling it all together. And then you just put a super massive reverb over the top. And um, I've grouped everything here so you can Uh, and I've got a few different uh, reverbs here. I've got the Lexicon plate. I created um, a similar one, or created a sort of recreation of the Lex plate in Ableton, and one in Ether as well. And one in Lexicon's one's the sort of best. You don't necessarily need the lexicon. You can use either or um, 
Ableton's built-in one. And again, you can sort of mix the, the sounds up here, especially a, um, similar to that W and W track where they're not using saws for the main uh, leads, they're using sort of more of a square. Um, so I'll go into Anna and I'll reset the uh, preset. And we'll create a sort of super saw and then we'll create a sort of um, super pulse. of the uh, ping pong delay. So on each of the oscillators in Nana, <coughs> um, you've got two of those. Um, you can have up to eight voices. And as, as you bring the voices up in Anna, um, they'll sort of split out to um, the left and right channel if you put your width control up, up full. And you need to take retrig off for a lot of the super saw stuff to sort of have its impact. And also, as you increase the voices in Anna, the D tunes get wider. Um, and once you get up to eight voices, you've got really wide width and you've got uh, really sort of far apart D tunes. One of the tricks you can do is if you bring it down to seven, when there's even numbers, or when there's odd numbers of uh, voices, it'll put one of them in the middle, and this will maybe give you a slightly more solid, stable sound. And then you can add another Anna with the same sort of setup, maybe with a lower octave. <clears throat> so this is another Anna, or another... This is just another oscillator in Anna, yeah. And that's really just to give a bit of body. And then to get that really fizzy sound, you can either go for a bit of white noise. Or use one of the mega saws and sort of mix it in. The mega saws were created just using um, a bunch of Anna's sort of like with super detuned and sort of um, reverbs and sort of delays already on them and then looped up. So they sort of have this really thick sort of um, super big sound. And just make sure you have key track on so it tracks the notes on the keyboard. And the mega saws have sort of a lot of noise in them. To give you that fizzy sound. And then if we add our reverb on at the end and our delay, you'll sort of hear how that sort of sound becomes super big. So a lot of it is down to that sort of big reverb vibe. And if you want to give your sound a sort of different vibe, you can just switch from saws to one of the pulses. Pulse 40 is sort of a, a good combination between sort of that thick, pulsy sound and a, and a sort of bit brighter, sort of uh, fizzier vibe. There's a question in here from Alan Loves Funk on the, the forums. Yep. Uh, how do you guys approach writing melodies from a theory point of view? Uh, he's, he's talking about great melodies interacting with each other. I think that's kind of demonstrated in what you're you're doing there. Yeah. Um, I don't think about theory when I'm no. writing melodies at all. You know, one th first thing I come up with is is I sort of I would use the keyboard. I'll, I'll sort of I'll try and go over to the keyboard here. <laughs> So I will just take the reverb off. My first sort of um, port protocol when I'm sort of sitting down is to do uh, a melody with a bass line. So I'll, I'll do something like this. You know, so you're, you're moving your left hand, 
working at a baseline and you're just moving your right hand um to sort of get a sort of melody and you know it might take an hour to sit there and sort of work out you know what notes are going to work well together once you've got those two key elements you can then start filling in the sort of middle <clears throat> it's almost like it's almost like if you think of a so maybe a weird way to describe it, but this is how it sort of comes across in my head is you know you have a, a guitarist mm -hmm. playing the chords and then you have a singer singing over the top and then the middle bit is a harmony so someone coming in on a harmony and that's what that's the sort of levels that i'm thinking of when i'm when i'm creating the riff you know that you've got your your bass at the bottom and then you've got your top line which is the melody that you want people to be able to hum and then the mid bits just sort of filling in the sort of the ex extra bits um, i think yeah i think to me i would i could spend days working on those interactions you know uh making sure that they're right because i think you can have all the greatest sounds in the world the greatest kick drums in the world but if it doesn't add up to anything it, it doesn't mean anything is that a fair assumption yeah yeah i guess you know one of the things to try and, and it's hard you know i think yeah you, you have to you have to have a bit of experience or a bit of practice at playing keyboards, but you know you have <coughs> to tr say. try and think about the feeling of what <coughs> you're doing. You know, not just is it does it sound right. It's you know sort of try and it sounds a wee bit corny, but lose yourself in the in the riff and sort of try and get an idea of what it what what it what it feels to you. You know, if you listen to some of the really good riffs, you know they they do exude a certain <coughs> type of emotion, whether it's sort of like mystery or you know mm. I don't know whatever you know ethereal or like magical <coughs> you know there's some sort of <coughs> me. emotional you know content in there that's being portrayed and i think really good riffs capture that i think it, it's definitely what you say lose yourself when you're making it whatever i think it in terms of um you know your plan for example when you sat down there to show someone how to do that you said you know play your, the bass sign with your left hand and play a melody over it with the right hand you need to have some kind of theory Ability, background yeah. there for for that kind of thing where is it do you I have a, I have a better theory background, but um, do I you would play Brian. I play the piano. You used to play the piano. You can play like, the piano I'm, better than me. I mean, I came I'm, down to your house and you were like, "Dude, yeah, you no, play I the entertainer." Play like, the entertainer. I like, but I, I I learned when I learned the piano. <laughs> what are you seven? <laughs> when I Come learned on, the mommy, piano, Daddy. I learned how to. I, I like I like bypass the the theory bit of it. I just learned what to play. You know, I, I did it by yeah, ear kind yeah. of thing. So I, I was more. I, when I see like musical notes, as soon as I do my exams and stuff for the piano, I, I was pretending to read, you know, the, the the pages. You know, I was playing the end of the song and I was I hadn't turned the pages. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I think hold on here a yeah, second. Yeah. So whenever I whenever I'm making music, um, I tend to I would I would make make a bass line first and foremost, and then once that bass line's set in stone, I would go off to the melody and try and interact with the bass line that yeah. way. And then maybe tweak it here and there or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I like I'm I'm <laughs> definitely not good at the keyboards. I mean, my thing is I've learned this one scale. <laughs> and it's like a C minor. Just take all C the minor other keys out. Yeah, it's like a C pentatonic, but with the, the old minor note thrown in here. And like, you know, it works for b the if you just use C pentatonic for the the bass line, which is just basically all the black keys, but move to the C scale you can sort of get away with just sticking to those notes for your bass and then you can do like a C, C minor chord or C minor scale over the top. And if you learn that, that's the only scale I ever, I've ever learned in my entire life. And it, and it works for all dance music as far as I'm concerned. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's why all my riffs sound exactly the same. <laughs> I've been getting away with that for about 15 uh, years. Brian, have we got another uh, Paul Maddox? Uh, we playing? do, we do, yeah. Well, this guys, we're going to just play another tech, a brand new tip, tech, tech tip from Paul Maddox. Um, we'll see you probably in five. Welcome to the Sonic Academy tech tip. Um, today, I'm going to be showing you how to use custom slicing presets in Ableton Live. Um, you may or may not know that um, you can slice easily to a drum rack in Ableton Live by simply right-clicking on some audio and hitting uh, slice to new track. So if we have a quick listen, we've got just a MIDI a, a audio loop here. Just a fairly standard loop. If we right click on that and hit slice to new MIDI track, uh, we then get a few options here. So transient means it'll slice it by every uh, transient, every hit that it finds. And uh, these are the presets that we have here. Now the standard built-in uh, preset, if we hit it there, we'll slice it 
There we go. And we can see we've now got um, this spread across the keyboard on different hits, which is very useful. But um, we're kind of tied to the uh, the controls that we're given for these. So we can control decay, sustain, release, and then some sort of loop start and uh, start point uh, type controls, which <clears throat> are very useful. But um, I quite often want to change the pitch of a loop, for instance, or maybe uh, you know you, the velocity settings that are on the, the default aren't really what you want. So what we can do is if we get rid of this, because we don't really need it right now, if you go into your browser here on the left, hit one, and in your live library, uh, there's a folder called defaults. Click on that, and inside that, there's a subfolder called slicing. Now, these here are the same as what came up in that list a minute ago, which are the different presets that live uses. These are actually just um, effect, sort of rack presets. So if we put in the built in uh, zero velocity uh, preset there and drive it onto a track, you can see that it is actually just an empty drum rack with a single simpler in it and the macro controls mapped to that. And then if you then use that preset to slice your own loop, um, it will use these settings, but obviously map all the slices uh, across these uh, the different cells here. So we can use this as a basis for mapping our own. So let's say we want to keep the ADSR as they are here, but instead of all these at the bottom, we want to have uh, pitch and I don't know, what something else anyway. So let's go into map mode. Uh, by going into here, hit map mode, and let's delete all these that we don't want. So we'll keep the ADSR and lose all the rest. Okay, so when we'll clear these, just rename those just to uh, save any confusion by command and R, and then just hit backspace. Okay, so then, so let's say we want to control pitch. So if we're in map mode, we'll hit the um, transpose uh, here, map it to here, and then let's do the fine tune as well, map to here. So let's call those coarse tune and fine tune. And of course, we don't want them to default to uh, all the way down, so let's hit delete on them to. Uh, center them to zero and let's just leave these two blank because this, this works fine as an example so if we then leave map mode and drag this rack uh, fold it back up and uh, drag this rack back in here into the folder and give it a name so let's call this um, with tuning <clears throat> and then that's saved into the folder delete this track and if we right click on our loop again and hit slice to new MIDI track, then in the presets here with tuning, which we just created, it'll show up in the list, hit OK. And our loop should be sliced, but with the extra controls. So if we hit play on here, you can hear that the loop's playing. And uh, then we should, the tuning controls that we just set up should work on every slice of the loop. So there you go, as you can see, that's a really easy way. And uh, you can set up these in much more complex ways. You can have chains of effects and all sorts of help behind them if there's things that you regularly use. So yeah, that's an introduction into uh, custom slicing presets in Ableton Live. And you're live. And I'm live. Okay, welcome back. And uh, hope you like that tech tip. I actually watched both those tech tips the other day, and they're oh, they're really really cool. I really like the kick drum one. Maybe sort of linking up the uh, sort of peaks and troughs of the kicks. That was very cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna. There's a couple of people have asked for sort of. Um, I think we did something similar to this last time, but I'll I'll maybe try and do a wee bit more depth. It was the sort of Tommy Trash and that sort of really aggressive um, bass line. That you're hearing at the minute. Um, I find a lot, a lot of the stuff that's out at the minute is it literally is the same stuff. Uh, no serious quite error. Over and over again with a, a slight uh, amendment to it in, in terms of of sound. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Swedish House Mafia who've pioneered that, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it all stems from that one sort of area. I'll just let me see if I can get a kick. Um, 
I mean, what, the state of EDM at the moment, guys. What word do you think it is? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it you know? Um, I mean, obviously, you've got the whole sort of explosion in America and all these massive festivals. So I suppose people are more interested in making it and selling it than they ever have been. I think. Uh, I think performance-wise, it's it's got very interesting with. Uh, Skrillex and those guys uh, they've taken it to a new direction I kind of like mm, I think in terms of uh, attention to detail that they have you know it started yeah. with that sort of whole minimal scene where it got really really intricate uh-huh. and now it's it's really intricate distortion is going on now the the distortion is intricate or yeah I think yeah. it is yeah. I mean the, 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 the way those boys make those, those bass lines like I mean Amount of time they must spend on it. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to attempt something here. I mean, the starting off point. <coughs> I've got a few more waves in my Anna than you, you may have at home. Let <laughs> 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 uh, me see. I get any. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I've got a. These will be out in the next version of Anna. There's a whole bunch of distorted waves. So again, I was listening to this this type of music and trying to sort of get a bit closer. The, these waveforms were just created, actually using a newer version of Anna that uh, I've sort of been testing out. And um, there's like a distortion filter on it, which you can get really close to those type of sounds. But um, So that sort of sound there combined with like kick saw, kick bass. I uh, almost layer that up with a, another kick saw just under it, an octave lower. Which you might be able to do in the next version of Anna. <laughs> yeah, which you will. Yeah, well, what, what you can actually do <laughs> um, if you want to have octaves in Anna is go to learn mm. and do an octave. So I've just hit two octaves there. And then mute the... Uh, yeah, you, then you can mute the first oscillator. So I'll play sort of, try and get a riff in. Let's find a... Uh, So again, you know, when you're, when I'm sort of starting a, w- with a riff, um, one of these types of riffs with a, a bass line, you know, go up and down the keyboard and find just where is t- tonally most interesting or, or it has that most solidity. So starting to sound a wee bit low and flabby there. Sort of around this area has got the most sort of power. this point where i start doing the uh, master and <laughs> yeah. have a side chain on that so already. i mean like, the the riff's not the best riff in the world but um you know so one of the things that uh, i like to do is keep a bit of space between the sounds so they're not just rolling into each other but you still want them sort of you know pretty close and then just get a lot of distortion and <laughs> distort it um, so I'll use I'll try Ableton's built-in one. I'm not a massive fan of this. Um, is is distortion where it's where it's at at the moment? Yeah, I mean I'll I'll show you a couple of different techniques. One uh, one thing you will be doing is parallel distortion. So we'll we'll keep the uh, original intact. So group the group the overdrive, and then add a a new chain. I'll just turn the chain off at the minute because we're just working on the distorted one. Um, so one of the things that you can get interest in distortions from is by putting a filter before the distortion and then distorting 
the absolute max out of it. And that gives you that really clicky sort of sound. And then when you sort of mix that in with your original. And then what we can do is duplicate that chain. And I'll, I'll solo it. And then you can be looking at adding other sort of effects to it. Um, the Redux is going to give you some nice... Again, having the filter first, going into overdrive and then the redux. Again, it's about finding those sweet spots. And don't be afraid to distort it again after. You know, so we're sort of getting closer there. Bit of side chain compression. Yeah, and you're sort of getting pretty close there. And again, you can just keep building that up, adding adding the different sounds. You know, you could be panning them left and right as well. And just sort of build them up with different effects. Um, Fab Filter, I've got a really nice plugin out at the minute called Saturn. It's about a hundred quid, um, and it is uh, like a, a, a multi-band distortion. And you can sort of select your each individual bands, and then add a different type of distortion to each of the bands. I was playing with it the other day on on some drums and stuff. But for this type of thing, it'd be really nice. It's got some really really heavy sort of guitar like rectifiers and distortions and different stuff like that. So a really cool sort of plugin. So any other questions there, Chris? Uh, just the somebody's on the R fish is asking about uh, Logic's weak spot. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of everything. Yeah, that's kind of my area. <laughs> I sound wise, I think eight and nine have changed from. I think seven was so good sound wise; it was really punchy, really tight. Something's changed in eight and nine, but I think Logic's big weakness is it's just too complicated to do one simple thing in Ableton or any other program. Logic has to have this big convoluted process. And that's really, it's not really Apple, you know, it's not really Apple's way, but <clears throat> I've worked with it since well, 98, 99. I know it inside out, coming fresh to it. Uh, I know you guys, when you see me working, I get really frustrated going, we can do this enabled in, in five minutes rather than the 20 minutes you're taking. That coupled with me being rubbish, uh, <laughs> it doesn't help. So I yeah. still think it's probably a wee bit better for arranging and, and mixing. Maybe. Yeah, it is. It's it, it's. A, to me, it's slightly more pro. Arranging wise and stuff, it's it's very strong. Uh, I I know from you guys, you get. You've also got the environment and stuff where you can sort of you know tailor stuff very specifically and wire <coughs> stuff. You can be bothered figuring out how to use it. That's a I played a bite with that for. You did your a long time thing. and that was ridiculous. It, I mean, it's uh, the environment is. I, I used to touch the environment uh, a long time ago. I don't anymore. Uh, I don't really need to. So I, again, plug-in wise, I think they're all pretty strong. Plug-in wise, the compressor, the multi-presser, the adaptive limiter, uh, EQs. You were you were our fish. You were having a problem or a question over the EQ. I, I don't see anything too wrong with it. You know, I I tend to use a lot of uh, Logic's own stuff. Yeah, I mean, so. plugins generally speaking, in all the major dolls are are decent enough. Yeah. I think the the weak spots are are maybe more to do with workflow in in the different ones. You know, I think Cubase and Logic are obviously lagging behind now. Some of the ones like Fruity Loops enabled in when that instant, you know, getting stuff happening instantly. Like, um, but I think enabled in lacks in the the mixing department, and I can't imagine that they're not going to sort it out for the next version. Mm. I mean, if they don't. You know, I think it was one of the things always leveled at reason was they'd never had really great mixing facilities, and then they did the record and then balled out and sort of made it all one again. But um, yeah, I think I think Ableton will need to come up with something better in the 
so, some department. sort of some sort of mixer is it yeah or? i'd imagine that the i'd imagine they'd have to put some sort of mixing proper mixer with you know is, or, is or, there a, a panel that can come off or something that'll you know yeah. is yeah. are there any a break away a breakaway arrangement yeah, kind of thing. Are there any do. rumors as to what's happening with? No, nah, no one knows anything. I'm sure all the guys left. Ableton went to Bitwig, didn't they? And I'll be I interested to see that, what yeah. that. All the I think the lead developer and a couple of the other main developers from Ableton left and are now developing it. Although it was could be vaporware, you know, it's been floated about a while, but no one's mm. ever had a go yet. Let's step away from that legal mind thing. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Um, I think we're going to um leave you with a tech tip tonight um we're cutting things a wee bit short tonight um uh with the view to maybe doing doing them a bit more regularly so um two hours probably a bit too much to go through but uh yeah so we're, we're going to just leave you with a tech tip tonight and um we'll try and get um another one after our our live show in the stiff kitten which will be coming up um in a couple of weeks seventh of Seventh of July. Just yeah, there's a, a few boys registered on the site there um for it and I don't think they were aware that it is a is a go to event. You know, you have to you have to actually turn up. Yeah, so it's in the stiff <laughs> stiff kitten in Belfast. What? I think yeah. it starts at uh, about eight o'clock. Yeah, think. we're gonna we're gonna try and uh sort of internet connection permitting. Yeah. Do it live, you know, stream it live, but I mean that may or may not materialized but we're going to record it anyway yeah it'll all be recorded for live um and then we'll do another live show after that and then i think we've got another live gig in Derry with a very special guest so we'll be announcing that at some point <laughs> <laughs> so thanks who, for watching who's that, that? Who's, the, who, who's the special guest i can't tell you yet because we don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, so will, will we will we start a rumor on twitter <laughs> don't know <laughs> no. No. okay <laughs> so Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in, and hope to see you all soon. And we'll leave you this tech tip. Yep. Goodbye. Hi, and welcome to this Sonic Academy tech tip. Um, today, I'm going to be showing you how to do a kind of feedback delay effect for uh, the kick in on a track. So, um, what we've got here, we've got a track that we've already uh, already pretty much finished, but it just needs a bit more hype on the kick in. So, uh, what we've got at the moment is this. <laughs> So it just needs a little bit more hype there. So we've got this uh, little old school vocal to throw in. Are you ready? Which works, but um, we need to have a bit of a delay on that that kind of carries on and gives the track a bit more, um, bit more excitement. So the first job is to add a new return track. So right click, insert return track down there. And you need a tape, uh, need a delay that's kind of a tape style delay really. Something that's got an interesting characteristic to it and it feeds back. So um, I'm going to get into my uh, audio units here and I'm going to pick uh, Sound Toys Echo Boy. So if we go into that and then set the uh, mix time all the way to wet, uh, the mix all the way to wet and turn the feedback up a bit and just sort of see where we're at to start with. There's lots of other plugins that are good for this. Any Anything that's sort of a tape style delay will uh, will do the job nicely. So stick a load of that on there. So that's the right, starting to sound right, so let's put the amount quite high. Are you ready? It's uh, in the right neck of the woods, but let's work on it a little bit more. <clears throat> so feedback up higher. Um, on this there's a styles thing, where so there's a space echo here, which will be a bit of a more rough and ready uh, type of delay. So turn that up, saturation up, midi sync on, and let's see how that sounds. Are you ready? So now you can hear the effect of the sort of feedback actually getting louder after it started. So it's feeding back on itself enough that it actually starts getting louder with the saturation, which is what we want. So if we make sure we've got no uh, tracks record arm down here and hit record, then the thing to do is to just set it playing and sort of ride the uh, feedback control so you get a cool effect. So let's turn it down a little bit to start with and hit record. So you just kind of ride that along, you know, so the feedback sort of pulses in and out and just as it starts to get out of control, knock the feedback back down again, just so that it doesn't quite ever get too uh, ear splitting. 
So keep that going for however long we want to. And let's kind of let it die off around about here. Yep, that should be about right. And we can see that that recording has uh, drawn a curve in there. So now if we hit play with everything else going, we should get a nice, uh, nice big hypey feedback delay sound. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we were after, really. Um, so one or two little fun, final tweaks to after that. I might just nudge this uh, here slightly so that it uh, comes up a little bit quicker at the start because it did sound like it uh, lacked a little at the start. And then another good trick is to uh, add a sidechain compressor over the top of the, uh, the delay uh, return. So if we throw a compressor on that chain there after the Echo Boy and set it onto a sidechain and we'll choose the kick... Uh, and then a little bit of fine tuning, we should be able to get a nice pulsing uh, effect. Are you ready? And there you go. That's how you use a, um, a feedback delay as a kicking effect. Um, obviously, changing the delay time using ping pong delays, you know, you can put other effects after it or even a little bit of extra distortion before it to really uh, crunch the sound up. But yeah, that's the essence of it. Stick a big tape delay on and sort of ride the feedback to get the effect that you want. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that tip and we'll see you next time.